Hi, and welcome, everybody. My name is Robin Mason. I'm with the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. We'd like to thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. I quickly just want to go over some just quick housekeeping tips before we get started, and I pass this over to your presenters for today. Um, as I've mentioned, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with any distraction from background noise when we get a number of people on the phone at the same time. Please feel free to use that chat box over on the left-hand side of your screen if you have any questions, if you're having technical problems, or if you're having trouble hearing any of the presenters. I'll make sure to pass that along. Also, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type that over in the chat box, and we will pass those questions along periodically throughout the presentation. If we don't get to your question right away, please don't worry about it. We may hold it till the end. It may some, we do something, maybe something we might be touching on further in the presentation, or we might do a follow-up with you later via email. I also like to mention I am recording this session. Um, what's nice about the recording is you can go back and view information that you might have missed, or if there are other members of your organization who you think this information might be helpful for, you can always go ahead and take a look at those recordings. They usually are up on our website a day or two after the session's been held. And we'll mention a couple times throughout the presentation where you can access those recordings. Um, there is also one more session in this series for next week, which we will mention also during the presentation. So please feel free to register for that if you haven't already. So I would now like to go ahead and pass this over to Kelly Heckman, who is the Executive Director of Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Uh, great. Thank you, Robin. Um, one person just said the audio is in and out. Is everybody else having okay time or is it just maybe that one person? Can I get a chat for how the sound is from everybody? Okay, great. <clears throat> I appreciate that. So yeah, as Robin mentioned, my name is Kelly Hackman and I'm the Executive Director of Global Federation for Animal Sanctuaries or GFAS for short. And welcome to the third webinar in our four-part Avian Roundtable series focused on adoption. And we present this um, and co-organize it with Avian Welfare Coalition. And for those of you who have not heard of GFAS in our work, we are an international accreditation organization that evaluates the care and management practices at sanctuaries, rescue centers, and rehabilitation centers all over the world. And as part of our accreditation program, we recognize excellence among sanctuaries and rescue groups, but also want to engage with those that are not to improve the care of animals, public safety, and sustainability of organizations. And for GFAS, our objective in originally sponsoring this series, um, we've been doing AVN series, uh, webinar series for about a year and a half now, was to provide some necessary information uh, for short-term care providers at animal sanctuaries and rescues. But in response to the comments that we received as part of those original series, we then decided to take on uh, the topic of adoption. And so today, um, as I mentioned, is our third of four uh, in this series. And while our focus is on birds, um, it's exciting today to cover a topic that has broad implications um, and it could impact um, organizations that provide uh, care for long-lived species of any sort. And before I um, <clears throat> hand, over, hand over the reins, I wanted to just uh, remind everybody uh, that we have some different resources available to you. First on our website, we offer a set of animal care standards that we use as part of our accreditation program. And those contain a lot of useful, useful information about care, safety, um, and also information about operations and governance for organizations. Uh, we have a website page devoted to our avian education program. And uh, this includes previous uh, topics that we've covered, uh, recorded webinars from uh, different, a variety of different topics. And those are all available for you at any time to watch. And as Robin mentioned, um, you can also find the registration link for next week's, web next week's webinar covering adoption contracts um, on that page, which again has lessons not only for avian uh, focused organizations, but those serving any species. And then of course, I wanna point out, um, there's a lot of valuable resources at other websites um, including at Avian Welfare Coalition's website, 
um, also at ASPCA Pro and Animal Sheltering. And um, right now, the, the format that we're going to use today is uh, addressing questions that, that you've submitted as part of your registration process or those that we felt could kind of give a little more background to this kind of complicated topic. But I just want to emphasize that, you know, as we're going along, feel free to, to add those questions to the chat box and I'll be moderating the discussion. And when, um, when it seems appropriate, I'll interject those questions in. Uh, to the conversation as well. So um, I just now will hand it over briefly to um, our, our co-sponsor in these uh, events, Animal Welfare Coalition, Avian Welfare Coalition, um, to Denise Kelly, who is the president and co-founder. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Robin and Kelly for their amazing work with putting together all of our webinar series. And I couldn't be happier to have uh, an organization like the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries as our partner on this initiative. Um, AWC was formed in 2000 to create a voice in the animal protection community for captive birds, and we continue to serve as an educational resource to the animal protection community, lawmakers, and the general public. One of our aims was to expand resources to help the growing number of birds in need, and uh, as we feel, we feel now, as we felt then, that engaging the animal protection community was a critical component of that. Um, doing our part meant that we would offer specific tools required to help shelters provide for the short-term care of birds in their facilities. Um, our avian shelter program was uh, developed over the years to deliver educational resources and to support animal shelters that take in birds. Um, our website, we have a dedicated section on sheltering which includes all of our um, downloadable how-to guides for shelters and um, links to these webinars as well. Um, in short, uh, our goal in facilitating this uh, these series is to develop those partnerships that are needed between avian rescue groups and sanctuaries and animal shelters and the animal sheltering community so that more birds can benefit by our combined efforts. Um, we also hope that this will encourage more avian rescue groups to explore the benefits of GFAS accreditation. Um, we recognize the process is vigorous but, and the standards are high, but I think we'd all agree the birds in our care deserve nothing less. For this particular series, as Kelly mentioned, we drew upon feedback we received from our previous webinars. And for this particular one, um, session on estate planning, I think it fits right in with our program because if, if more people made planning for their animals in the event they couldn't care for them or their own demise, we'd probably have less birds in shelters. So <laughs> with that, I would like to introduce our uh, today's expert, Francis Carlisle. Frances Carlisle is a trust and estate attorney who lives in New York City. Her estate planning work includes wills and trusts for animals. Ms. Carlisle has a BA from Barnard College, an MS from Columbia University, and a JD from the University of California, Davis. Um, Frances is admitted to practice law in New York, New Jersey, Florida, and California. She's an active member of various bar associations and has organized conferences on puppy mills, horse protection, and global warming issues. Frances is a frequent writer and lecturer and has appeared on Animal Planet and other television networks to discuss the importance of estate planning to provide for the continuing care of animals. With that, I would like to turn this over to Frances Carlisle. Well, actually, Hi. I will. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I will actually be uh, moderating so that, you know, I, I'll present the questions and then Francis is generous enough to uh, give us some important insight into those questions. So um, I think it's a good 
um, question to start us off. Can you tell us a little bit about your practice? Well, um, first, thanks for having me. Uh, I think it's really important to get the word out uh, of how important planning for birds is. Um, I've always had an interest in helping animals. And one of the reasons that I went to law school is that I thought that legal training would enable me to be of more help. When it turned out that I liked the field of estate planning, then I started thinking about how I could best help animals within that specialty. And I discovered um, that an important and usually neglected part of estate planning uh, was a plan for the continuing care of a client's dogs, cats, birds, horses, and other companion animals. And birds need estate planning in particular because so many of them have such long lifespans. And so why do you think it's important to include birds and other pets in the estate plan? Well, first of all, more than 60% of American households have a pet. And uh, after Hurricane Katrina, a majority of pet owners told national pollsters that they would refuse to evacuate ahead of a disaster if they could not take their pets. That shows that pets are not merely property, but important family members. More and more pet owners don't want to leave the care of their pets to chance, and they want to make provisions for the care of their pets in their wills. Pets can end up at a shelter because there is no one willing and able to take the pets after the owner dies, and so estate planning is needed uh, for their protection. And, and um, I want to note for those of the listeners who are involved, who are involved with bird shelters and sanctuaries, um, uh, it's very important that they understand the estate planning options, not only for their own birds, but also for people who adopt birds from the shelters and sanctuaries. Um, as Denise Kelly just said, is if an adopter has a good estate plan for the bird he or she adopts, that bird is less likely to end up at a shelter in the future if the, if the bird owner dies. So the more planning that bird owners do, the less burden will be on shelters and sanctuaries in the future. Great. And I just want to point out that um, Denise reached out to a lot of our accredited sanctuaries and also to her own personal collection of photographs of birds that have lived a really long lifespan. And those are featured in this presentation throughout. I just feel like it's really amazing to see all these um, birds that are, you know, really long lived. So I just wanted to really focus on on that and thank Denise for putting those uh, getting all those together. And of course, thanks, Robin, for, for putting it into the presentation. Um, do you think that most people make provisions in their wills for the care of their birds and other pets? No, I don't. And I, I believe that most attorneys drafting wills don't even mention it. They, they don't make the care of pets a routine part of the estate planning process. Um, some of my clients come to me saying that they were dissatisfied that their former attorneys didn't adequately address the issue of estate planning for the care of their animals. This needs to change and planning for the care of companion animals, especially birds, should become a standard part of the estate planning process. So in my opinion, if you go to an attorney for an estate plan, you should insist that there's adequate planning for the good care of your animals. And if that attorney does not take the issue of planning seriously, find another attorney. Uh, but if the attorney does take the planning seriously but doesn't have a lot of experience, that's okay. If they understand bequests and trust for humans and have a willingness to learn, they can do estate planning for birds and other animals. And I want to mention that all some, all some people prefer the term companion animal to the term pet. Uh, the state statutes, which allow us to create a trust for the care of our animals, are called pet trust statutes. So I will use the term pet and companion animal interchangeably. And also, I'll be talking about estate planning for the continuing care of birds and other companion animals. Birds are part of the animal kingdom, and in this lecture, when I use the term pet or animal, it will include birds. And I use the term pet owner, as companion animals are still property under the law. So owner, owner is the correct legal term. The law has not caught up with the feeling of many people that their animals are members of the family and that they are not the owners, but rather the guardians or caregivers of the animals. Thanks. 
Can a pet owner leave money in a will directly to a bird or other animal? No, animals can't be the direct beneficiaries of any money or any kind of property. Um, there are basically two different ways to provide for the continuing care of an animal after the owner's death. First is an outright bequest in a will of an animal and funds for the animal's care. And the second is the creation of a pet trust for the benefit of the animal, either in the will or in a separate trust document. Uh, now, to help you understand the estate planning process, I, I'm going to review some basic information about transferring property after death. And I apologize if you already know this, but in case some of you don't, uh, I just want to explain how things work. Um, let's say that um, someone passes away without a will or a trust or any estate plan. What happens? Well, the property passes in what we call an intestacy, and that means it passes to, um, to the next of kin. And each state has a slightly different statute, but basically, uh, let's say your only relatives were, were brothers and sisters and their children, it would pass to your brothers and sisters in equal shares, and if one of them had died, then that share would go on to that, that, niece, that brother or sister's uh, children. So basically, um, the problem with this is that uh, you, there isn't a way to make, uh, there's no provision for the animals, uh, there's no way to leave money to charity. It's going to end up with the family members if you don't do anything. Um, so um, also, so that's why most people, you know, we try to get them to at least do a will. And a will, in a will, you can have a couple of different kinds of dispositions. Um, you can have an outright disposition, let's say $10,000 to my friend so-and-so, my tangibles to uh, somebody else. Um, uh, you can have a percentage of your, the balance of your estate go to a charity or to family members. And you can also set up trusts under your will. You could set up a trust, for example, uh, if you had minor children, you would want to set up a trust for, so that there was money for their care until they're old enough to handle the money. And also if you have animals, you would want to set up a trust um, uh, for their care as well because they, they cannot care for themselves. So, um, so the will can do all of those things. The will can contain a trust uh, if you want. Um, now, some people, um, in some states, it's very popular uh, to avoid probate because probate can be kind of difficult and takes some time. So in a number of uh, areas, people tend to do um, uh, what we call a revocable trust to avoid probate. Uh, there are different names for it in different places, but basically, it's a document that will act like a will when you die. Basically, it will have all the same provisions as the will when you die, but you won't have to go through probate because you've set everything up ahead of time and you've put all, retitled all your assets in the name of the trust, so everything just passes on your death. Uh, but you can also, uh, in one of those revocable trusts, you can have the same sort of bequest outright, or you can have a tr another trust within that trust, uh, say a pet trust if you wanted. And then finally, there are um, separate trusts that you create while you're alive for various specific purposes. You might create a trust, um, for example, an education trust for one of your nephews or something like that, but you can also create uh, while you're alive a separate, uh, what we call intervivos trust for your pets. And you can set that up while you're alive, you can fund it and have it operating. And then when you die, the successor trustee named in that trust would just take over. So there are a number of, a number of, of vehicles for uh, planning after you die. We had one question come in. Um, do all states recognize pet trusts? You know, that's interesting. And, and I was gonna talk about that. Um, uh, when when I started working in this field, you know, 25, 30 years ago, only a couple of states had pet trust statutes. But boy, there has been such um, an amazing, um, the law has changed so quickly uh, that states have just been passing these statutes like crazy. Um, uh, and um, 10 years ago when I did an article, there were 20 states that had Petra statutes. Now, as of about a week or two ago, I just talked to a friend and colleague of mine in Minnesota, which was the last holdout, and they have passed a Petra statute. That means all 50 states 
have Petra statutes and the District of Columbia has its own Petra statute. So now it is uniform across the country. Every state statute is just a little different, but basically they all uh, enable you to create a trust to provide for your animal, your pet, right. your bird or other animal. Great, thanks. Can you explain the outright bequest, how the outright bequest works to protect birds? Oh, okay, so, uh, yes, as I said, there's, uh, there's two main ways of providing for the care of animals after your death. Um, the pet trust, which I'm going to explain in, in a lot of detail later, but, but the simplest way is the outright bequest. So basically, um, uh, with the outright bequest, you find a friend or family member who's willing to take and care for your birds after you die, and then you, you uh, put that in your will. You know, you give your birds to that person. And, uh, and also, you, you want to give some money to that person to defray cost of care because it can be expensive um, to care for animals for life, particularly if they have a long life. And you should also name alternate people in case that person uh, can't take the animal when the time comes. It may be several alternates because things come up in people's lives and, so, and, and, and they may not be able to take the animal. Um, it's really the pet owner's responsibility to make arrangements with these people before the will is drafted. And um, and and this, you know, let's say you're in a, in a big family, you all love animals, and um, uh, nobody's allergic, there aren't any, you know, issues like that. Uh, you may want to do an outright bequest to um, to various family members, a series of family members, and 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 you can and you'd be pretty sure that. Um, the bird would be taken care of because the younger family members would take over if, if uh, one of the older family members died. So sometimes this works out well. And we've been talking about leaving your pets to a friend or family member. What if the pet owner cannot find anyone to take and care, care for the birds? Well, I have I have a number of clients here in New York City who are um, you know, single and elderly, and they ha just don't have anyone that they feel could care for their birds. And um, so there are a couple of things you can do. One, if you pick the right executor, someone who really um, is concerned about birds and likes birds, you can give them the authority to find good homes for the birds and give the birds to those first people along with, uh, with, with some cash. Out, then that, that's another outright bequest. Uh, but you have to be sure, I mean, that's a little iffy. You have to be sure the executor um, can do that and, and would be able to find someone to take your birds. Another alternative is to look for a, a charity that rescues and places birds in new homes and make, make arrangements in advance with that charity to take the birds after your death and to find homes for them. And um, be named in the will to to receive the birds and to receive a legacy. And probably it should be a substantial amount because of the work involved in finding good homes for birds and the fact that so many uh, charities are overextended. Also, if the charitable organization is gonna find an adoptive home, you should obtain detailed uh, information about the charity's adoption procedures and you should be comfortable with those procedures. Um, just as an example here in New York, um, uh, I'm not sure about birds, but I know, for example, the ASPCA will um, agree to find a home for your cat or dog um, if you give a bequest to the ASPCA. Um, and they, they do a good screening job, but once the animal goes to that new home, you don't know what that person owns that animal and you don't know exactly what's going to happen to it. Uh, and some people are comfortable with that and, and some people aren't. Um, in all cases where, where animals or birds are bequeathed, the will should include a statement that the birds include all, bir all birds owned at the time of death. If you only name specific birds in your will, it may not cover uh, birds adopted later. And most people who have birds or other animals have, may have different ones, a uh, succession of birds. So it's best to say, for example, um, I give my African gray parrot Edith and all other birds that I may own at the time of my death too, and then name the person or charity that is selected to take the birds. And also, it's a good idea to prepare a memoir of instructions and information for the person who will care for your birds in the future. 
This memo can, inf can have information about food, toys, veterinary issues, behavior issues, anything else you think is relevant. And it can be changed from time to time as your birds age or as you adopt addi additional birds. That way the person you know, has an, uh, always has an updated um, uh, schedule of, of, of you know, how, to, um, how to best uh, care for this bird. Great. Can you talk about creating a pet trust for the care of birds? Uh, yes. Um, the the other way, you know, other than the, the outright disposition or bequest of the birds and funds for their care, um, is that you can create a pet trust in any of the 50 states to care for your birds. Um, uh, in New York, where I practice, I've created many trusts for the care of the pets. Uh, whether they be dogs, cats, birds, or even horses and farm animals. And what are the advantages of pet trust as opposed to the bequest of a pet to a friend or, friend or family? Um, well, if you leave a bequest of your birds and funds for their care to, a, to, to an individual, that may work out just fine. But what happens uh, to the birds or animals if that person uh, has to move to a residence that doesn't allow birds or develops allergies or goes into a nursing home or, or dies? Um, you know, then it sort of depends on what plans that person has made for the, for the, uh, for the birds. With a pet trust, there's more continuing protection. When you create a pet trust, you name a trustee, uh, you name successors, and that trustee handles the funds in the trust and pays for the expenses of the care of the birds, and, they, and that trustee oversees the care of the birds. And the, and the court can appoint a trustee if none of the trustees named in the trust can act. So um, the trust is, never fails for lack of a trustee. Someone will be appointed, although you want to name alternates so that you can choose the right people um, to be trustee. Now, the... The trustee can act as the caregiver. That's the person who has the, the birds in their home and cares for them on a daily basis. Um, or, um, the trust, or you can name a different person to act as caregiver, and you can name alternate caregivers as well. Um, and, but in any case, if a caregiver at any point in the future cannot act, the trustee has the obligation to find another care, care uh, taker of the birds. Um, and in many states, you can name a different person to go to court to enforce the trust if the trustee is not doing his or her job properly. So there is a lot of protections for the birds with a pet trust. In other words, uh, you could have the trustee, the caregiver, and the person enforcing the trust all sort of looking over and making sure that the birds are, are being cared for properly um, and that the money is being used as it should be, be used for their care. Interesting. What do you recommend if the pet owner can't find good people to act as a trustee and alternate trustee? Well, um, if the pet owner can't find anyone, and sometimes that happens, that some people don't have a lot of uh, people that are interested in the same kinds of animals they are, uh, one suggestion uh, that I occasionally tell my clients that they put into the, um, the pet trust that the board of directors of a local charity, a uh, local charity, in this case a bird charity, be given the authority to select a good trustee, an alternate trustee for the pet trust. So that at least there'll be a trustee who's likely to be knowledgeable about and care about the birds. And um, anyway, the trustee, as I said, all, all has its, the authority to find good caregivers if no one has been selected by the pet owner. Um, and, you know, if needed, um, uh, caregivers can be paid from the trust for caring for the, for the pets because it is time consuming. I mean, you don't want someone who's doing it solely for the money. You want them to care about the birds. Um, but, um, but sometimes it's helpful to find a good caregiver if they're willing to get a little salary for doing, doing this work. Some birds have a very long lifespan, such as parrots. Isn't estate planning a challenge for an animal who can live so long? Um, yes, uh, yes, I've heard that there are some species of parrots who can live 80 or 90 years. So the problem with planning for these animals is that the bird may outlive all of the trustees and caretakers that are named 
in the documents and, and selected by the pet owner. And of course, the court can appoint new trustees, but um, you know, particularly with birds, it needs to be the right trustee who really understands uh, the, species, the species. And in addition, there are a few pet, um, pet trust statutes that only allow a pet trust to go for a term of 21 years. There aren't too many of these states, but I know New Jersey is one of those states. Uh, most of the states, though, allow uh, the trust to go for the lives of the animals. Uh, if you have long-lived birds, one thing I can suggest is that you find a charitable organization which op operates a bird sanctuary and make arrangements with that sanctuary. And if the sanctuary agrees, leave the bird and a cash legacy to the sanctuary. Um, the pet owner should visit to determine if it's a good facility and it has been in existence uh, for a while and is well funded, so it's likely to be around for the life of the bird. And you would need to leave that charity, that sanctuary, a substantial amount of money to cover the cost of care for such a long life and because so many sanctuaries are already overburdened. And you may want to even leave a separate legacy to the sanctuary to help out with the costs of caring for all of the birds uh, in the sanctuary. Um, I have a few clients with parrots, and what I do for them is a, what I call a belt and suspenders pet trust, meaning that I create a pet trust for the lives of the birds with trustees and caregivers named, and you know it's funded well, the trust, and I also put provisions in the trustee that in certain situations, the trustee can take the birds to a sanctuary and pay for the bird's care there if the sanctuary agrees, and that if the trustee believes that that move is in the best interest of the birds at the time. Um, in this case, the trustee still keeps control of the trust funds and pays for the care of the birds at the sanctuary, and the trustee can move the birds to a new sanctuary or an individual caregiver if beneficial in the future. Uh, this type of pet trust must be very well funded in order to assure that sufficient funds will be there for the lifespan of the birds. So I had a couple questions that came in that are pretty similar. So they're asking about, okay. uh, can wills or trusts or bequests be done independently? Um, is it best to use an attorney or do you know of any like website resources such as LegalZoom that would possibly play in a appropriate role? Well, um, my view is that it is best to use an attorney because it can be pretty complicated uh, and to do it right, you, uh, and not just any attorney, a, a special, someone with a specialty in trusts and estates. Um, now there is a, um, a, a, new, um, a new website that's coming up um, that I've been involved with a little bit, where they're going to have trusts for each of the 50 states, and it's going to be pet trusts, and it's going to be um, uh, very reasonable um, to create one through the site, but it's not up yet. Um, uh, when I get more information about that, if you want to email me, I'm glad to tell you about it. But if you can afford it, I say uh, I think it's good to... Um, um, see an estate planning attorney, a trust and estate attorney, and have an, a, a, an entire plan uh, for all of your beneficiaries, and then include um, as part of that plan the care of the animals. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, if you could share that information with with GFAS or Avian Welfare Coalition, then we'll put it up and have it out there for all right. people. All right. I think I'll I'll have it in a month or two. Okay. Great. Um, so how is a pet trust funded? Uh, well, pet trust can be funded with cash or with assets other than cash. Um, it's, it's pretty flexible. Some pet owners fund their trust with the proceeds of life insurance. Uh, I have some clients who rescue uh, animals and they don't have a lot of money, and so they might take out a small life insurance policy to fund their pet trust so that they have um, you know, some money that, that's there for the care of the animals. Um, uh, but basically, methods of funding can be as varied as with a trust for human beneficiaries. Um, you know, it's, people ask, how much should I put in my trust? Well, it depends 
on a lot of things. I mean, um, people with that are wealthy put more money in their pet trusts than people who don't have a lot of money. And um, but you know, a general rule would be leaving uh, is to calculate the amount that that you need each, each year to pay for the food, veterinary care, and other expenses during the bird's or other animal's life. And then you need to add to it because um, you may have younger or additional animals at the time of death. I mean, most people have a succession of animals and they don't just have one animal um, and that's it. So, um, you know, you, you, you can add to it and, um, you know, to make sure that there's enough in there. And, and remember that the trust, the trust may have to pay a caregiver, and that might be another expense. Um, and also the trust has to, has to pay the trustee an annual commission. It's usually a modest amount, but it is something that's paid every year for the work that they do. And they, you also may need to file um, a, uh, a, a, a trust tax return. You may need the services of an accountant. Uh, so you have to take those expenses into account uh, when deciding how much to put into the trust. And do you ever put anything other than liquid funds, such as cash, into a pet trust? Yes. Um, I, I, you know, in some cases, pet owners have a lot of animals, or for other reasons, they have a strong desire that their animals remain together in the in the family home. Uh, maybe the pet owner has has animals in the home that will be difficult to place. Maybe they have behavior problems um, or destructive um, for whatever reasons. Um, the the um, pet owner really wants those animals that are bonded with each other to stay together as a flock or as a group in the family home. So in some cases, the pet owner's residence can be placed into the pet trust along with the animals and enough liquid funds to maintain the residence to pay and to pay for a caregiver to reside in the home. Uh, in this way, new homes don't have to be found for all the animals who can live out their lives together in a familiar setting. Of course, having a residence in the trust for the animals can only be done when there are sufficient assets uh, to cover all of the expenses. Uh, now, some pet owners, you know, direct that an expensive residence be sold, but that, you know, a less expensive residence be purchased by the trustee, perhaps in, you know, in the warm part of the country, or maybe a little cabin or a small place where the birds and a caregiver could live together inexpensively. Um, uh, I did this um, putting um, uh, a residence into a trust for a client of mine who had a farm upstate New York, and he had rescued many different species of animals, um, not birds in particular, but he not only had dogs and cats, but he had horses, and he had goats, and he had chickens, uh, among and probably some other species as well, and he wanted all of them to be protected and cared for. So um, we created a pet trust. We put his farm and all the animals on it in the trust and enough money so that um, all the expenses of the house, the taxes, the upkeep, um, all the expenses of the care of the animals could be taken care of and enough to pay a caregiver to live in the house so that he, um, he feels comfortable that if something happened to him, he could um, know that his animals would be taken care of for life. Great. Can any amount of money be put into a pet trust? Well, um, most states have pet trust statutes that state that the amount funding the trust must be reasonable. Uh, there's very little case law on what is reasonable. It depends on the number and ages of the animals, what the yearly costs are, and the life expectancy of the animals. But it could be a large sum, uh, for particularly for animals with long lifespans. Um, the New York Pet Trust, which I use the most, um, states that uh, the court can reduce the amount in the trust if it determines that, that the amount in the trust substantially exceeds the amount that is needed for the care of the animals. And what happens is that the amount of the excess that the court determines it, it, it will go to the remainderment of the tr pet trust. Now, every trust has a, 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 a first beneficiary, like a life beneficiary, like a pet or a child. And then it has, when the, when the trust terminates, 
it has what they call a trust remainderman, and that is the individual or charity that gets what's left when the trust terminates. So the money isn't wasted. If you put too much in your pet trust and you put, say, let's say you put a bird sanctuary as the remainderman, it's not going to be wasted. It's going to go, the anything left over will go to that bird sanctuary, either uh, when the trust terminates uh, the court terminates it or when, uh, because they find an excess, or when the um, last animal dies, it will go on to that sanctuary. So it won't be, uh, it won't be wasted. And um, I haven't, you know, basically um, most courts accept um, uh, the amounts that go into pet trust. Uh, that it's it's very rare that that something is considered unreasonable. So even with a house in the trust, uh, I think that would be upheld. What happens when the last pet dies and there are funds left? Uh, well, uh, you, you know, as I said, um, that the funds that are left pass. Uh, passed to whoever is named in the pet trust as the re as the beneficiary of the remainder interest, the remainder money we call them, and it can be an individual or more than one individual. It can be charity or more than one charity. And while the primary concern of a pet owner in creating a pet trust is usually the animals and not the remainder money, that's usually an afterthought. Um, it's important. The selection of the remainder money is important because the trust remainder money has standing to come in and complain about anything going on in the trust. So they can complain if they think too much is being spent for the animals. So I recommend to my, my pet owners uh, when they're creating a pet trust that they consider selecting a charity um, that has the same species as the animals that are being cared for. So if it's a, if it's a pet trust for birds, uh, that a bird charity be the remainderman because they understand and are more sympathetic to generous provisions for animals than a, than a family member, say, might be. And I also um, add a provision uh, stating that the interests of the animals have priority over the interests of the remainderman so that if needed, all of the funds in the trust could be used for the animals, uh, and nothing would remain for the for the remainder men. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a question about um, with the pet trust. Are there any issues if the caregiver is out of state from the trustee? Uh, wait, are there any issues if if what what is that again? If the caregiver is out of state from the trustee. Does that present a problem? Oh, all right. Well, you know, I mean, of course, it's always nice if everybody's together so the trustee can make frequent visits and they can, you know, um, he can drop over and see the birds once in a while. But um, if you have a really good trustee in one state and a really good caregiver in the other state, that can work. Um, the, um, the trustee isn't going to visit all that often. I mean, the trustee might visit um, um, twice a year just to see how the bird's doing. He has an obligation, the trustee has an obligation to make sure the bird is, is doing okay with the caregiver. Um, so, I mean, I think that can be done. I mean, I don't think you have to be all in the same area. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's whoever is going to do the best job. And, you know, er, you know, everything is done now, you know, by internet and by email and, and all of this stuff. Um, it, the only thing would be that the trustee really should visit once in a while to see how the animal's doing. But they could do a lot of things like pictures and Skyping, and there's a lot of things that could be done uh, so that there, you know, there wouldn't even maybe need to be a visit. Mm -hmm. So I've been talking about state planning for the continuing care of a pet after the death of a pet owner, but should there be any preparation for emergencies such as the hospitalization or disability of the pet owner? Absolutely. This is part of estate planning to me. You, you need to plan not only for death, but also for other things that may happen, disability, hospitalization, um, you know, major changes in, in life that will affect uh, the care of the animal. Um, so a couple of things. First, if the, if the pet owner is not able to care for the pets in the home, uh, whether it's short term in hospitalization or more longer term, somebody must be available to get into the residence to feed and care for the animals. So the pet owner should have arrangements, uh, made arrangements for a friend or family member to have access to the residence and to come in and feed and care for the animal uh, if the pet owner is incapacitated for any reason. 
Um, here in New York, I mean, I tell my clients who live in apartment buildings that they have to have somebody, uh, somebody's name with the management. Uh, so they have permission to come into the building and go into the apartment. That person may need keys. Uh, you want to pick someone you trust. And, um, and uh, so, that, so that's really important to have something like that. Um, and it's important for all pet owners and everybody actually uh, to execute what's called a power of attorney, appointing an agent to handle financial matters um, if, if, there are inco if, if someone becomes incapacitated. And I add a specific provision to the powers of attorney that I do, which states that the agent has the power to and should use the pet owner's funds to pay for the care of the, of the pet owner's pets. So there's no question that that is the intent of the pet owner. And I also, and you should also have a, an agent who's um, sympathetic and, and uh, to your animals and um, thinks, it, thinks it's a good idea to use the money for, for their care. There are some people that are a little hostile uh, to animals. Um, and um, I also recommend to my clients that they carry a card in their wallet stating who to call in case of an emergency to care for uh, their animals. Uh, if there's an accident or some other emergency, the police usually look through the wallet to notify emergency contacts. And also for people living alone, particularly elderly people, uh, a note giving the name of the people to be called to care for animals in case of emergency can be placed in a prominent place in the house, such as near the front door, so that um, there's, you know, if, if there's an emergency and the pet owner is taken to the hospital or even has died, the person selected to feed the animals can be easily contacted. Otherwise, the animals are generally taken to the animal control facility, which is not, not good for them. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, it's probably a good idea for uh, particularly an elderly person living alone to have one of those uh, uh, buttons to press in case of falling or emergency or to have someone checking on them uh, on a regular basis uh, to make sure they're okay, because that also has an effect on the animals as well as the person. Um, and in addition, the pet owner should work with an estate planning attorney to make short-term arrangements. Um, for a couple of periods. One is the period for the, um, after the pet owner dies, but if you have a will rather than a trust, there's a period when, um, it, you know, when the will is being probated, and then that can take several weeks or several months. And during that period, you need to have somebody with authority to go in and care for those animals. So um, um, that's something to take care of. And if the pet owner has created one of those inter vivos pet trusts, I mentioned separate document already set up, already funded with a successor trustee named, the successor trustee can just take over and start caring for, um, for the animals. And um, anybody who puts up any money for food and care for the animals, um, um, uh, you know, w would be reimbursed from the estate if somebody died. And even after the will is probated and the executor is appointed, uh, pets have to be cared for until the animal goes to the um, person to whom it's bequeathed, if you bequeath the animal to a friend or family member, or, or to the, exec the trustee of the pet trust, if there's a pet trust. So there's a period there where the executor is responsible for the care of the animal. And uh, so again, uh, selecting an executor with concern for your animals or for that species of animals is very important. Great. What if the pet owner feels strongly that the bird has a lot of problems and will not be able to adapt to a new situation? Well, occasionally uh, I found that a pet owner wants a provision in the will stating that the pet should be euthanized after the death, death of the pet owner. And it seems unusual to some people, but uh, often the pet owner has a fear that the animal will be abandoned or abused or because the animal is elderly, ill, or has behavior problems. Um, but euthanasia provisions have been overturned. These provisions and wills have been overturned in, in a number of state courts. So a better approach, if this is what the pet owner wants to do, is to give the executor a certain amount of time to search for an adoptive home for the animal, and only if a suitable home cannot be found, then to allow the executor to take the animal to a veterinarian for euthanasia. Uh, 
Francis, you're cutting out a little bit. Are you still there? Oh. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Can oh. you hear me now? Oh. Yeah, there you are. Oh, we can hear you. So, okay. are, oh. were you done with that Go question? Or? Okay. Yeah, yes, I am. Um, we've been talking about individuals who need to do estate planning for continuing care of their birds, but what happen, What about people who run charitable organizations, whether large or small, sanctuaries or shelters, what should they be thinking about? Uh, first of all, um, I imagine that there are individuals out there who love birds and run a, a small sanctuary from the home. Uh, for example, let's say Jane is busy rescuing and taking in birds and caring for them in her home, and she considers the work that she does as charitable, but she's been so busy taking care of the birds that she never had time to file for a 501c3 tax-exempt status, and even more important, she never got around to doing any estate planning for the birds. So the big question with Jane is, what happens if she dies unexpectedly? unexpectedly without an estate plan that provides for the care of her birds. Um, I have to say that most people die without a will or other plan. And in these cases, family members inherit the house and other assets under the intestacy laws. Family members can then sell the house and sell or otherwise get rid of the birds. And it's been my experience that at least one of the family members inheriting will want the house sold right away in order to get their share of the assets as soon as possible. And they don't care what happens to the birds living there. So it's very important for Jane to have a plan for the continuing care of her, the birds in her home. She can have a pet trust uh, for their benefit as I discussed before. And if she has a number of birds, of birds living in the house, she could consider putting the house into the pet trust so the birds don't have to be moved right away. Another option is that Jane um, uh, could sign a will which leaves her birds in her house outright to a bird rescue charity or sanctuary. And that charity could then take over the care of the birds and the charity could decide whether to care for the birds in, in the house or sell the house and, um, and use the proceeds to care for the birds in another facility. What if Jane has a plan for her animals in her estate planning documents, but she's elderly and worried that in the weakened state in the future, an unscrupulous family member or other person might convince her to sign a new will or trust leaving out the birds. Is there any ironclad way of protecting the birds? Well, if Jane has a bird charity that she trusts, uh, she could sign a deed gifting the house to the charity and reserving a life estate for herself in the deed. That way we, she would have full rights to live in the house until her death, but upon her death, the house would pass automatically to the charity. Uh, while she is alive, she would be responsible for paying the expenses and the taxes for the house. Um, but, you know, I would only recommend this um, uh, in certain special circumstances uh, because it is generally an irrevocable act. So it's not something to take lightly. And what do the people in charge of charitable organizations that operate bird sanctuaries and shelters do to protect the birds in their care? Well, charitable organi organizations have tax-exempt status and are governed by a board of directors. Um, by the way, I'm not an expert in charitable corporation law, but I would say that one of the most important actions that a board can take is to develop a good succession plan so that there is a way for successors to take over if one or more of the key people are not able to act. It's often difficult to ha have a good plan and to find competent people to take over, but it's so important to have this plan uh, for the future success of the charity. Another thing um, that officers and directors should do is to have good program planning, uh, to know what their goals are and stick to it and not get sidetracked um, and, and spend their money on things that, that was, is not, are not part of their mission. Also, it's important as part of the planning for directors 
to plan to make sure that there's going to be sufficient money in the future to take care of the birds that the charity is taking in. Um, as we know, when the economy takes a downturn, contributions go way down. Charities need to have a considerable amount of money squirreled away for the lean times, and they should not take in so many birds that they become overextended. Easy for me to say, huh? <laughs> Even the most well, well-run well charities with dedicated officers, directors, and volunteers cannot perform miracles and cannot take in every bird that needs care. Um, also, I would say that charities with similar purpose or purposes are sometimes competitive with each other, um, but I think it would be beneficial to have a close relationship with another charity and maybe have an arrangement to help each other in times of uh, crisis. Um, now, I want to say that um, uh, the next webinar will be Jane Hoffman will be speaking on adoption contracts. And she is an attorney and she runs a large charity for animals here in New York City. So she is expert on charitable corporation issues. And I spoke to her yesterday and she is glad to answer any questions that I can't answer on, on the subject um, uh, when she gives her webinar talk in a, in a week or two. Great, I appreciate that. Yeah, obviously GFAS, uh really finds that kind of planning for organizations really important as well. So we're happy to answer yeah. any of those questions there as well. Uh, Leona Helmsley left millions to a pet trust for her dog. Was her plan typical? Uh, no, her plan was very unusual and that the amount funding the trust was so large. Uh, you may have read uh, she left $12 million for the care of her dog. And even though that amount was reduced by the court to $2 million, that's still a huge amount for the care of one animal. Most people want to provide for the care of their pets, but they leave a rather modest amount for that purpose. After Leona died, the news was full of stories about her estate plan for her little dog named Trouble. And that was good and bad. It was good because it brought attention to the existence of trust to care for our animals, but bad because it was such an unusual plan and one with so many problems. Um, I got a chance to review Leona's will, which left the $12 million to a separate inter vivos pet trust, meaning the trust that she created while she was alive um, for the benefit of her, her dog. And I reviewed this pet trust as well. And from looking at these documents, I saw three issues for the plan for her little dog. First, when providing for the care of an animal, the pet owner should leave a reasonable, um, reasonable amount for that care. Um, $12 million was way too much, and after Leona died, Trouble started receiving death and dog napping threats and was in such danger that the little dog had to be hustled out of her Connecticut home and flown under an assumed name to a secret location. It's reported that there were over 40 threats against the dog, and that caused extra expense to the trust as between, you know, maybe 200000 a year had to be paid for round-the-clock security. And that amount was, of course, more than any other expense for the care of the dog. Um, the Helmsley estate executors um, um, applied to the surrogates court to reduce the amount going to the pet trust from $12 million to $2 million. Did they do this because of the public outcry or because the court felt that the trust was overfunded? No, actually they did it because one of the executors realized after Leona died that funding the pet trust with $12 million would have created a huge estate tax liability. If the pet trust was funded with $12 million, there would have been about a $5 million federal estate tax bill. And if the pet trust was funded with $2 million, there would be a, a, a zero estate tax bill. Um, now, the other problem I saw with Leona's will is that she bequeathed trouble to her brother, who then didn't want the dog. Uh, as this is always a risk, when I draft a pet trust, I put the animal into the trust, as trustees have a fiduciary duty to safeguard property in the trust, meaning that the trustee must make sure the animal is, you know, safe and cared for. And I can do this because animals are still considered property under the law and so can be placed in it into a trust. In a way, you can't blame Leona's brother for not taking a dog who's receiving death and dog napping threats, but I heard that the dog was well cared for by a friend and innkeeper who had known Leona before her death and, and uh, was cared. the dog was cared for until the, until the dog's death in 2010. 
Um, the other thing I'll just mention in Leona's will is that it states that when the dog dies, the remains are to be buried next to Leona's remains in the Helmsley um, Mausoleum at a cemetery in New York. However, the cemetery law does not permit animal remains to be buried in human cemeteries. I do have several clients who want to have their ashes buried next to a pet's remains, and this can be done by purchasing plots at certain pet cemeteries that allow this. Um, so while this is not a plan that most people want, um, but it is an option for certain people who want to be buried with the remains of a, of a beloved pet. In New York in 2011, the New York Division of Cemeteries tried to stop this practice of, of people's remains being buried in pet cemeteries. I think they were losing business, they felt, and they issued a regulation banning it. Um, but there was such a public outcry that this regulation was, was revised, and human remains can now be buried in pet cemeteries again. Fascinating. Um, and what is the most important thing you can tell people who love their birds and other pets? Well, it's important to take the first step and make some plans for the continuing care of your birds and other animals. See a trust and estate's attorney and insist that they make satisfactory provisions for the care of your birds in the estate planning process. It's not rocket science. Any competent trust and estate's attorney should be able to plan uh, for the care of animals. And even though I'm in the process of retiring and not taking on new clients, I try to make time to work with attorneys who want to learn how to prepare a good estate plan for birds and other animals. And I appreciate your inviting me here to spread the word. Well, we're very happy that you could be here today and it was really educational and I think a, and a really amazing, an amazingly important topic that doesn't get a lot of discussion. Um, so really, thank you for, for being here. Um, I do want to again oh. point out that this, um, this presentation will be put up um, in the next few days on our avian education page and remind you of some of the other opportunities for education that we have out there um, with uh, Avian Welfare Coalition. And then listed also here is Francis um, Carlisle's website if you want to learn more about her and her work. And um, I'll just leave it as a, a final word. You know, again, we're doing these webinars to really help um, benefit avian welfare in long-term and short-term care situations. And um, I just really appreciate everyone who's being in attendance here today. I um, also want to thank Denise Kelly for her, her support in putting this together. And of course, Robin Mason as well. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, Francis, I'm already, I already put down some notes. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and I, I and I'm, I'm glad to, to try, I'm glad to try to answer questions uh, via email if somebody has a, a burning question about, about this topic. It, it was a, a, a wonderful presentation and very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you. I also just want to say there were a couple questions that we didn't get to today. And um, if you don't mind, Francis, we'll, we'll send those to you if you could get um, answers to those. I'd be glad, I would be, I would be glad to answer them. Great. Thank you. And Robin, did you have any last minute housekeeping? I don't think so. I just uh, want to thank everybody for attending and thank Francis and Denise and Kelly. And everybody have a great day. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.